We live in a world gone mad, or so it would seem. But is there an agenda behind the madness? We're seeing nothing less than a civil war in the United States with anarchists running wild in many of America's largest cities. How and why is this happening? Paul Johnson's seminal book titled Intellectuals makes this insightful observation. The notion that Marxism is a science, in a way that no other philosophy ever has been or could be, is implanted in the public doctrine of the states his followers founded, so that it colors the teaching of all subjects in their schools and universities. This has spilled over into the non-Marxist world for intellectuals, especially academics, are fascinated by power, and the identification of Marxism with massive physical authority has tempted many teachers to admit Marxist science to their own disciplines, especially such inexact or quasi-exact subjects as economics, sociology, history, and geography. Marxism stokes the fires of revolution, and what better place to sow the seeds of revolution than through the educational system? What we see in the streets of America today are the fruits of stoking those revolutionary fires over decades. Put simply, to overthrow a nation and impose socialism, a sufficient number of people must suppress all dissent and impose on the majority a totally new value system, and this is done through intimidation and rewriting the history and values the nation holds. In The Snapping of the American Mind, David Kapelian quotes former Soviet Union leader Vladimir Lenin, demonstrating his hostility to the very idea of God. Every religious idea, every idea of God, even flirting with the idea of God, is unutterable vileness of the most dangerous kind, contagion of the most abominable kind. Millions of sins, filthy deeds, acts of violence, and physical contagions are far less dangerous than the subtle, spiritual idea of God. Marxist-Leninist philosophy has taken root in academia throughout America and Europe, from primary to university level, and the true believers are actively spreading their dogma and suppressing any dissent. Warnings against what is happening are coming from numerous voices. As early as 2007, Miriam Grossman sounded the alarm against the suppression by intimidation taking place in major university campuses. Her first edition of Unprotected kept us in the dark as to her identity, revealing only that she worked on a major American university campus in the health department. She explained in the preface why she wrote as Dr. Anonymous, MD. What price will I pay for being politically incorrect? You probably didn't know what some insider psychologists are now revealing, that psychology, psychiatry, and social work has been captured by an ultra-liberal agenda, and that there are special interest mafia in our national organizations. Likely you didn't hear that certain points of view are squelched, that there are horror stories of shunning and intimidation, and that many will not speak up, fearing ridicule, vicious attack, or loss of tenure or stature. If there is anything we've been fed over the last several decades, it's that we need diversity and tolerance. But she points out the hypocrisy of those pushing these platitudes. Yes, the university and my department were committed to the principles of diversity and multiculturalism. This commitment was plastered all over our policy statements. But somehow, through the years, I got the sense that the diversity that I represented wasn't the same type to which they were so profoundly committed. The reality is that it is expected that we must accept and be tolerant of the immoral behaviors these activists promote. But it is not a two-way street. Most people want to be reasonable, and without a strong moral foundation, tolerance is a powerful mantra. Tolerance is not and never was a part of their agenda. Kirsten Powers is a self-proclaimed liberal, but she became so disturbed by what she was seeing that she wrote The Silencing, How the Left is Killing Free Speech. The illiberal left believes that people who express ideological, 
philosophical or political views that don't line up with their preferences should be completely silenced. Instead of using persuasion and rhetoric to make a positive case for their causes and views, they work to delegitimize the person making the argument through character assassination, demonization, and dehumanizing tactics. Have you ever wondered who are these politically correct or PC police who impose their views on the rest of us and suppress any and all dissenting voices? While some describe these activists as leftists, Ms. Powers prefers the term illiberals. But by whatever name, they are totalitarians who have set out to suppress all dissent. These are the self-appointed overlords, activists, university administrators, journalists, and politicians who have determined what views are acceptable to express. So shut up or else. Intimidation comes in many forms. As we've seen, it's well entrenched in universities from which our future leaders will come. But it's ubiquitous, found everywhere. Even many liberals are becoming alarmed. Cancel culture is where individuals are called out for removal due to anything the PC mob deems objectionable. The New York Post recently published this June 13, 2020 opinion piece by Kevin Williamson under the headline, Social Justice Warriors Are Waging a Dangerous Cancel Culture Revolution. In the course of a week, three editors went down. James Bennett of The Times was canceled for publishing an opinion on the opinion page. Senator Tom Cotton's defense of the Insurrection Act, which permits the use of federal troops to quell riots. Claudia Eller was pushed out at Variety after penning a white privilege mea culpa that was found to be unconvincing. Adam Rappaport of Bon Appetit was canned for much the same reason. His offense aggravated by a turn-of-the-century photograph of him dressed as a stereotypical Puerto Rican at a Halloween party. These men and women were not fired for using racial slurs or engaging in abuse. They were fired for giving voice to views that the mob wishes to see silenced. You may not know the names, but I think you get the point. In the case of James Bennett at the New York Times, it appears that he was sacked after the millennial mob at the paper viciously protested. But cancel culture more often comes from the keyboard warriors who hide behind anonymity on Twitter, Facebook, and other electronic platforms, where they can destroy careers and reputations of anyone stepping out of line. Williamson went on to write, the imbeciles on Twitter are unserious people, but unserious people can produce serious problems. There's a word for the situation in which there's no room for disagreement. The word is not justice, it is totalitarianism. That is what cancel culture is, and we have seen it in highly developed form in such places as East Germany under Honecker and China under Mao and the Cultural Revolution. It's no wonder that a July 2020 survey by the Cato Institute found that 62% of Americans are self-censoring personal views out of fear. According to a National Review article, the only group for which a majority of its members felt that they could safely voice their opinions were staunch liberals. Conversely, 50% of staunch liberal respondents said they would support firing a business executive from their job if they donated to the Trump campaign. 36% of staunch conservatives said they would support firing a Biden donor from a similar position. But it's not only in the United States that this is happening. Every Canadian is familiar with the flamboyant, flame-throwing Don Cherry, who is passionately pro-Canadian. He's often been in trouble for expressing strong opinions, and whether you agree or not with how he expresses them, he is what he is. People tend to love him or hate him. Wearing red poppy pins in November is a big deal in Canada. But Cherry went too far for the PC police when he used the phrase, you people, when speaking out passionately about immigrants. He was complaining that he rarely saw people he believed to be immigrants wearing red poppy pins, which are worn as a symbol of remembrance to honor fallen Canadian service members. You people, you love our way of life. You love our milk and honey. 
At least you can pay a couple bucks for a poppy or something like that, Cherry said. These guys paid for your way of life that you enjoy in Canada. These guys paid the biggest price. Sportsnet said in a statement on Twitter that Cherry's comments were divisive and do not represent our values or what we stand for. One of the most famous cancel culture episodes is when Goya Foods President Bob Ununue was invited to a meeting with President Donald Trump and had the audacity to say something positive about the country's president. It did not take long for activists, celebrities, and politicians, many of whom are Latino, to take to social media, condemning Ununue and Goya. More often than not, individuals apologize in an attempt to please the woke mob to save their reputations and careers, as in the case of New Orleans Saints quarterback Drew Brees, who spoke out in favor of American values. But after the mob went after him, he made the mistake of thinking he could calm the storm by apologizing for his sincerely held beliefs. Instead, the mob tasted blood and his supporters were disappointed in his capitulation. He lost from both sides. Unlike Breeze, Bob Ununue refused to apologize. He showed respect for the office when invited to the White House, first by President Obama and then President Trump. He courageously stood his ground, and the result is that Goya food products flew off the shelves as supporters loved his stand. Some bought tens of thousands of dollars to buy Goya and distribute the products to food banks. But Ununue is the exception. David Capellian makes this observation in The Marketing of Evil. Unfortunately, people who aren't strong and sure of their beliefs simply cannot withstand the demands of unreasonable, angry intimidators. They give in, they compromise, and they even adopt the bully's views as their own to keep the peace. Another intimidating tactic is called doxing, as explained in this July 17, 2020 USA Today news story. Sometimes when people voice controversial opinions online, they get doxed or have their private information researched and posted by a digital vigilante. Who wants an angry mob showing up on his front lawn? America is at a crossroads. When America falls, as it surely will, unless there's a change of course, Western civilization as we know it will go with it. And when I say change course, I mean turn to the God who created us. Dishonest, hypocritical, immoral culture that suppresses truth was all predicted in advance. And this is part of the reason why the wrath of Almighty God is coming on our rebellious world. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. That's from Romans, the first chapter, verse 18. Yes, the truth is suppressed in unrighteousness, and it is accompanied by a denial of God, resulting in every kind of immoral behavior. God literally gives such individuals over to a debased mind. That is a mind void of judgment exactly what we see today. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whispers, backbiters, haters of God. I don't have time to read the entirety of this passage, but I recommend you take out a Bible and read Romans, the first chapter, verses 18 to 32. See if it does not describe where we are in today's world. The prophet Isaiah also spoke of this time in chapter 59 of the biblical book by his name. No one calls for justice, nor does any plead for truth. They trust in empty words and speak lies. They conceive evil and bring forth iniquity. They hatch vipers' eggs and weave the spider's web. He who eats of their eggs dies, and from that which is crushed, a viper breaks out. Citizens call for justice, while agenda-driven leaders talk about justice but do nothing for the people they supposedly serve. Sadly, it appears that some agree with the woke mobs. The end result? Therefore, 
Justice is far from us, nor does righteousness overtake us. We look for light, but there is darkness, for brightness, but we walk in blackness. We grope for the wall like the blind, and we grope as if we had no eyes. We stumble at noonday as at twilight. We are dead men in desolate places. Skipping down a few verses, we find a chilling description all too familiar. And transgressing and lying against the Lord, and departing from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart words of falsehood. Justice is turned back, and righteousness stands afar off. For truth is fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter. So truth fails, and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. Here in America and elsewhere, free speech was once considered a sacred right, and countries such as the United States, Canada, Australia, and many other countries also value freedom of religion. In the world in which we live, we here at Tomorrow's World are very thankful for those rights where they exist. But freedoms of speech and religion are rapidly being suppressed through intolerance and intimidation by the very ones who protest the most about intolerance. Now, does this mean that freedom of speech and religion should have no bounds? It may surprise you, but not according to the Bible. Neither freedom of speech, as we know it in many of our Western nations, nor freedom of religion are godly principles. I'll explain why in a minute, but first let's notice what the Bible says about these subjects. Should speech be without limits? When the Apostle Paul stood before the council, a council member was instructed by the high priest to strike Paul on the mouth. Being stung by this, Paul responded, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall, for you sit to judge me according to the law, and do you command me to be struck contrary to the law? Horrified by Paul's words, it says, And those who stood by said, Do you revile God's high priest? And Paul immediately responded, I did not know, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it is written, You shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. Paul was not intimidated and cowed. He did not apologize for speaking the truth before a hostile council. He apologized because he had unknowingly violated the statute of God found in Exodus 22 and verse 28. Another example that dispels the idea of free speech as we know it today is found in Exodus 21 verse 17. In addition to the fifth of the Ten Commandments that we are to honor our father and our mother, we find this stern warning against wanton disrespect for parents. And he who curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. Now, just so that no one misunderstands, imposing the death penalty upon anyone for any cause is not yours or mine to take. Not even in Israel was a parent to impose such a penalty on his own. We might see these verses as overly harsh, but there was a reason for them. God knew that any nation that allows disrespect for parental or constituted authority will eventually destroy itself. All you need to do is look what is happening in the streets of America today, as anarchists fight violently against police, tear down monuments of the nation's founding fathers, burn and loot, while politicians refuse to back constituted authority. So if speech has limits, how do we know what those limits are? The Bible reveals the answer. Truth is to be our guide. Now Pontius Pilate asked Jesus on the night in which he was betrayed, what is truth? And Jesus gives the answer while praying to his Father regarding his disciples. Sanctify or set them apart by your truth. Your word is truth. Truth is to be our guide, and truth comes from the word of God. The ninth commandment tells us, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And the apostle John tells us in the book of Revelation, but the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. We have rejected God as the ultimate authority. Therefore, we're left with lots of opinions, but no authority to determine truth. 
So we're left with a world filled with foul language, pornography, disrespect for authority, lying to promote one's personal self-centered agenda, and punishing others through cancel culture, doxing, shouting down, and intimidation. Truth, justice, and godly morality have fallen in the streets, and we are all impoverished as a result. Our hope is not in human solutions, but in the return of Jesus Christ and tomorrow's world.